Well, how blessed I am to be here on Donut Chapel. <laughs> Must have known I was coming. I thought maybe it was because it was Cinco de Mayo and my last name is Fabares. <laughs> Favares, as they say south of the border, where my family has not been for four or five generations now. But uh, it's good to be here back at Talbot, back at Biola, a campus that has invested in me and that I have so many cherished memories of being even in this room. And I know that many things have not changed about this institution since I was here. Actually, many things haven't changed since uh, Reuben Torrey founded the school, and that is to produce people that have a high view of God and a high view of his word. And I trust that's what's happening in your education here at Biola or Talbot or whatever department you may be in. While the purpose of this campus hasn't changed, I I think you understand how dramatically the world in which God is preparing us to serve in has changed. It has dramatically changed and it continues to change. The hostile forces of darkness in our culture are much um, like they have been in other places around the world and even in biblical history, but uh, really unknown for us, our parents, our grandparents. Uh, This is a a, a rapidly changing culture that we're in and the battle that we face is the one that was eloquently prayed about just a moment ago, and that is the battle that we all face with fear, worry, anxiety. While all rages around us, as we prepare to stand up as salt and light in our culture, we recognize that's not as easy to have that peace that God would expect us to have in our own hearts. Listen to the words that were taught to the young Israelites to sing in the sacred Psalter. Psalm 112 says, the righteous will never be moved. Their hearts are steady. They're not afraid of bad news. They trust in the Lord. They will not be afraid. That's a challenge, and it's more of a challenge today, I suppose, for us, certainly here in the United States, than it's ever been before. Unless we have our news flipped off and we're disconnected from the world, it seems like every day the news gets worse and worse the decaying moral climate that we're trying to stand up and live for Christ in is is increasingly dark. And I wanted to take a few minutes today in the last three verses of what is the most famous song of all in the Psalter, and that's Psalm 23. If you have your Bibles, please call that passage up. I'd love to preach the whole thing if only I had a full allotment of preaching time, which chapel, of course, does not provide. So let me get half of this. Psalm 23, one of the most famous psalms of all, not only for those in the church, but even the world knows the words of Psalm 23. A writer who stood in some dark times with some hairy Philistines before him, with a coup d'etat in his own kingdom, and he knew what it was to have really dark times in his own life, and yet he writes these familiar words. Let's read them. Verse number one, as he sees himself, the former shepherd following the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for he is with me. Is that what it says there? He doesn't say that. And that's the key to this psalm right here. You see the pronoun shift? Look at all the he's in verse two and three. Verses two and three. Three, he makes me lie down. He leads me beside. He restores my soul. That's a great testament to what God had done in David's life, but now this is the heartfelt prayer. Even though I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I have these experiences that are frightening and hostile, I will fear no evil. Now he speaks directly to God in prayer. For you are with me. Not his rod and the Lord's staff comfort me, but your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and then the metaphor shifts from the sheep to someone seated at a banquet table. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever." If only we had time to spend more time in verses one through three, we don't, but it's easy to do, and we've been singing the songs about counting our blessings and the importance of that when things get scary in our church, in our life, in our family, is certainly to look back at what God has done. As the old hymn says, "'Tis grace 
has brought us safe thus far, his grace will bring me home. As David himself said when he faced that gargantuan Philistine, he said to Saul and the team, he said, you know, I was delivered from the paw of the bear and the lion. The Lord did that for me, and and he'll take me through this trial. I've been through a lot. And that's great to chronicle that, and we all should. It should be a pattern of our lives to journal, to write these things out. But I want to focus on when we're in the middle of that dark valley, when the shadows are cast long, when it's as scary as it's ever been, and when we're walking through that, I can vanquish the fear, I can defeat the anxiety, I can conquer the worry in my life, according to this text, because I have an awareness of the presence of God and two things listed here that represent one aspect of that God is that he's with me and he has a rod and a staff. Now that's the picture, of course, of the shepherd carrying the short little stick, the rod, the shebet as it's called in Hebrew, and when it's bejeweled, it's called a scepter. When it's in the kitchen, it's a utensil, but when the shepherd carries it in his belt, it's a a weapon. It's the close quarters kind of weapon. It's a stick, but it's a stick that can be used to defend the sheep. Then, of course, the the staff, picturing as you do in the Sunday school image of the big, long stick with the crook at the top, and we often saw it in Sunday school, saving the lamb, the sheep that's in trouble, but when it comes to a wolf or a bear or a lion, that's the number one weapon. That's the weapon to defend the sheep. Sheep, they don't have claws, they don't have venom, they don't have fangs, they're defenseless. But the thing that keeps the sheep from fear, the thing in this analogy that's supposed to keep David, no matter how dark it may get in the kingdom, to be at rest in his own heart, to be the righteous that's not moved, to be the one that's not frightened by bad news, is to know that the Lord has weapons to vanquish every foe. He has that ability, even though he doesn't do it, according to verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I'd much rather you take those tools and those weapons and, and rid the horizon from my enemies. That's what I'd like. Take the medical crisis away. Take the opposition away. Take ISIS and just, just wipe them out or convert them all. We don't want to deal with this, God. If you have the power to do that, exercise your power. Well, that's not what this passage promises, nor is that the experience of any Christian in the room. God has the power, but he doesn't utilize that power to vanquish every foe. The promise of this text is he can provide you some respite in the midst of this, even though the problem's still on the table. That's the real challenge for us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I know what that's like. I grew up in the family of a uh, police officer. My mom was actually a judge, worked for the LA bar. My dad was a Long Beach cop. Talk about law and order, being raised in a a home that was pretty strict. That was my house. That was my home. And my dad wasn't your average cop. He was a motorcycle cop, and he was the kind of cop that went far beyond all the regulated and necessary tools like the nightstick and the mace and the gun. He carried all kinds of weapons under every, you know, pit and orifice of his body. He was ready to fight. He had guns everywhere, one under his armpit, one strapped to his ankle. And I I knew one thing about my dad. If we ever ran into trouble, you want to be near him. He had the weapons. Now, I grew up in his home, he had all the weapons he needed to vanquish every foe I could ever face, and yet he never shot anyone. I wanted him to shoot several people at my junior high, but he never did. He never did. But as we drive back, I was thinking as I was driving up the freeway, as my dad and I were driving once, just the two of us one night, saw some prowlers in our church parking lot, a big sprawling campus, and he just pulled in, turned his headlights off, and we rolled up. Now, that, I don't want to go near the bad guys, but Dad was going to go check things out. But I knew this about Dad. He had the power to vanquish the foes. And so I could sit with him as long as I'm with him, and I, I can find that sense of peace. It'll be trepidatious. It may make my blood pressure go up. It may be something that causes me to pray like I never have before. When it comes to the center of my heart, can I be like the righteous that will never be moved? I'm not going to be moved off center here. I can trust him. I can trust him because I know he can take his great power and change any circumstance in life. Remember there in Mark 4, the 
Bibles that we read usually have an editorial heading on it that says, Jesus calms the storm. You've seen that passage, read it, studied it. Some of you have preached it. I mean, that, that's a great text. And we often preach it as a Christological text. Look at the power of Christ over nature. You want to talk about divinity? Look what he can do. And that's how the disciples responded, right? Even the wind and the waves obey him. But let me recommend that that's really a poor heading for that section of Scripture. Because the thing that really was going on in that text was that when it was all finished and they freaked out on that lake because of the storm, Jesus looked at them and he didn't say, yeah, I can calm the, the seas. Look at me. Look at the power I have to command the wind. He looked at his disciples and he asked them a question. He said, why are you still afraid? Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Where's your faith? Don't you trust me? See, Psalm 112 is completely the core issue for us. The extent to which you worry and fret and fear in your heart is the extent to which we don't trust the all-powerful, omnipotent God that we follow. He didn't promise to take every foe and vanquish them, not, not in our circumstances of life. He didn't say every cancer cell would be eradicated from our loved one's life. He didn't say he'd fix every issue. But he did say, you need to trust my power. And you need to know that I can. And one day I will. The problem of why he doesn't, that's a whole other issue. The whole theodicy, the figuring out why in the world God allows it, that, that would take us some time. But we should be at rest that God is a God who says, I can do this. I know that you may fear the situation as being overwhelming. But really, as rhetorical as it may sound, why are you afraid? Christ is in the boat. You can do this. Now, the text says here that he anoints our head with oil. He overflows our cup. He prepares this feast, this table, even though we're surrounded by enemies. And that's the respite we want. That's the tranquility in the midst of the storm we want. As the New Testament puts it, that's the peace that surpasses all understanding, that makes the nurses, that makes the friends of yours, that makes your family members say, why aren't you freaking out? That's what we want. And God has provided it for David. Remember when he was running from Saul? Here he was on uh, Israel's most wanted every, every night. And, and Saul and his, his armies were chasing him down, and God brings him to En Gedi, that little oasis out there in the Judean desert. And one more time, frees him from the hand of his pursuers, and he celebrates. He sets up this uh, monument, and he calls the rock there, Selah Hamelakoth in Hebrew, the, the phrase that sometimes is just transliterated in our translations. It means the rock of escape. God did it again. Now let me sit here and, and eat some dates, and let me sit here and be refreshed by the brook, and let's enjoy the oasis, because God is a God who has all power and given, has given me life for another day. There's another godly man who responded very differently to the table that was prepared for him in the presence of his enemies. Elijah, I mean, I think you want him teaching your Sunday school class. He's a very godly, knowledgeable person. But when God took him out to Beersheba, when Ahab and Jezebel were chasing him down, and God had fed him with ravens two chapters earlier, and now he's got angels baking cakes for him and giving him a table, even though he's being pursued by his enemies. He doesn't respond quite so well. You might remember his response. Elijah says, God, I've had enough. Why don't you just kill me? Now, here's two guys who both preach and teach about the omnipotent God. And in the midst of their trial, one says, I've had enough. I can't do this anymore. I cannot continue in this. I'm the last one. Surely there's no one left but me that's going to stay faithful to you, God. Just kill me. He can't enjoy the tranquility of God's provision in the midst of the storm. We always want God to calm the storm. But the challenge here for us is to make sure that we don't fear no matter what happens in our culture, no matter what attacks we may face because we stand with Christ. We have to affirm that God is a God who has the power and that we measure our trust by the way we can vanquish that fear by knowing that he's with us and his rod and his staff should comfort us. This verse Six ends this great text with a play on words that's often missed. It says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. There's the word follow. That Hebrew word is not the word you might normally expect. Radoff in Hebrew is the word to, to pursue, to chase, to hunt down, which is exactly the way you would describe what's been happening in David's life as he ran as a fugitive from Saul and his men. He knew what it was to sit in an oasis and have God's provision even though he was being hunted and chased down by his oppressors and enemies. And 
In this text, he says, you know who's really chasing me down? You know what is really chasing me down? God's chasing me down, and he's got two things for me here. He's got two things, and these are two such common words in Hebrew. Tov, good, goodness. And then you know this word, hesed. Mercy, it's translated in the ESV. This faithful, merciful, gracious, loving kindness. You see, even though you may see the problems in your future or the headlines in the news, a shooting in Garland, Texas, or the encroachment of our liberties as Christians in our country, the Bible says the real thing that's hunting you down is not our opponents. It's not a crumbling, morally corrupted society that keeps looking at us and taking away certain opportunities that we used to have and our grandparents had, but it's God's goodness and mercy. And it's not that he's playing games because he knows there's real problems and issues at stake. And even the the three Hebrew slaves knew that it may be that God does not deliver us and doesn't save our church or save our health or whatever it might be. But remember how they responded before King Nebuchadnezzar? Even if he doesn't deliver me, we're certainly not gonna go down without courage and faith in God. We know he can, we trust him. Because in the end, though their eschatology may not have been all that well developed in this particular point in in, in progressive revelation, we know this, that the spirit of God that guided this pen knew exactly where this is all headed, right? And even the psalmist knew, at the right hand of God, there's pleasures forever. God has good plan for us and good will prevail, as the New Testament puts it, though the kingdoms of this world, they may get really spinning, completely out of control. It may be that we are persecuted in America like they have been in other parts of the world. There may be things that frighten us and and really threaten our well-being. But the Bible's very clear that one day the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. You wanna have peace in the midst of a storm, you better know where this ends. As Romans 8 so powerfully puts it, the juxtaposition of sheep that are led for the slaughter that doesn't seem like a very victorious picture. He said, and even in this, we're overwhelmingly conquerors. Why? Because we know where this is headed. That God is gonna work all things together for good. Ultimately, we'll look back on this. When we dwell in the house of the Lord, and that's not just a reference to David being near the tabernacle. Certainly the spiritual overtones of that. That one day we'll rest in the kingdom of God when all the foes will be vanquished and every enemy and every participant in ISIS will bow his head before Christ. There will be a time when this all ends well and it's the most fundamental teaching of Christianity. Christ wins and those who ally themselves with Christ win. Remember when David was being hunted down, he gathered people together in the cave of Adelam and it doesn't describe those guys very uh, uh, you know, positively. They were the riffraff, they were the malcontents, they were those that were not happy with things and they sat around with David and they were his men and they ran around from cave to cave trusting in David who trusted in the good shepherd because he knew God's in charge, he's sovereign, he has all power, he's working together things for good. I don't know where this is headed from an earthly perspective but I understand God's in charge. Those guys followed David around and then one day, many years later, 12 years later, David would be uh, enthroned in Jerusalem. I often think what it must have been like for those guys, those few hundred people who said, we're gonna stand with the outsider. We're gonna be accounted and allied with the one that's on Israel's most wanted. We'll be with him. We're gonna continue to live a virtuous, godly life and follow the king. The Bible says you follow the son of David, no matter how stormy the culture gets, no matter how difficult or scary it might be, then you know how this ends, and you should have a confidence this ends well. I uh, have three kids, as I was introduced as having. One's a senior in high school, a junior in high school, and my daughter is in sixth grade, and for some strange reason, they've gotten into watching Jeopardy, and I'm not sure why. Of course, we have the recorders, so they've gotten into recording them, so when they have a chance, they get to sit down and watch Jeopardy. Well, we don't watch a lot of TV in our house, but we record a few things, and come dinner time, when it's over and it's time to clean up, we usually turn on something and watch that as we're sweeping up and cleaning up and all of that. And so there was a night when my middle kid, who happens to be the one who uh, fancies himself the smartest one, probably because he is, and um, he wasn't there. He was out somewhere doing something, 
and uh, we watch Jeopardy. And uh, you know, Jeopardy, you get like what, 10%, 20% of the answers, I don't know, you may get 30, but you know, we sit around washing dishes and saying, yeah, I think that's, you know, whatever, the you know, uh, battle of the bulge, you know, whatever, we have, we have the, the best we can at this. Well, we watched that, no big deal. Next night, we happened to have dinner together and everyone happened to be there, including Smarty Pants, my middle-born child. And we were done with dinner and we said, well, let's turn on television while we clean up here and we turned on Jeopardy. My daughter had the remote control and I winked at her as I told her to go down to yesterday's episode of Jeopardy. <laughs> and she did, she got it, it was great. This communication we had without any words. So she puts on the Jeopardy we saw yesterday. Now, Jeopardy's hard even when you saw it the day before. <laughs> but we were doing a lot better that next day. Now, of course, we winked at each other, and my, my Brainiac kid had no idea that we had watched this. And he got really frustrated. Because, you know, he, he doesn't know the answers, and he's tapping his foot, and he's yelling out his answers, and then my sixth grader's going, you know, whatever, 1842. And, and, <laughs> and, and she was right. He was enamored at the intelligence of his family, which at some point gave way to his sense of something's not right here. <laughs> you guys have watched this, haven't you? How can you tell, right? I, I think to myself, the Bible has given us the whole reel of history, hasn't it? I wouldn't have all the details. It's not in high definition. But we know where this is going. It's going to get worse before it gets better, and then it's going to get better, a kind of better that I don't care how bad the bad is now, the good is way more good. It's way better. And we know how this ends. And for me, as I'm sitting there watching the questions come off, there's very little stress. I know where this is going. I know the categories. I know the answers. There's a kind of peace that surpasses all understanding because we know where history ends. You have to trust the one who has history in his hands. No young couple conceives a child so that the wife can go through labor. Right? Do you follow that? You know, we conceive a child so we can have a child. There's the joy in the child. And yet Jesus said, you know, history is a lot like birth pangs. Labor will get intense, contractions will get closer together, and you will go through some really intense problems worldwide before the birth of the kingdom. Now the joy of the kingdom will make us forget the pain of the labor, but the Bible said it's gonna get worse before it gets better. I need people as the storm whips up and gets worse to trust me. Why are you afraid? That's the challenge. If we know that in the end, his mercy and goodness will not only chase us, but will overcome us, and all we'll have in our lives is the mercy and goodness of God, because we'll dwell in his house forever. That's where God would like us to live. People struggle, especially with our 24-hour news cycle and all the cable news and everything on our you know, iPhones coming in and telling us the bad news every 15 minutes. How can Christians be joyful in the midst of all that? I mean, it is getting worse, and we have more exposure to the bad stuff and beheadings around the world and the issues and the politics in our country. We get, it's, it's a lot to process. But just like the increasing labor pains, it should give us a sense that we're almost done with this. It's almost over. You get that, right? We have that experience when we fly across the country every time, coming into L.A. or coming into Orange County. It's been a long flight, the seats are small, they've gotten smaller in the last 10 years, it's just worse. Either that or I've gotten a lot bigger, but it's a, a very uncomfortable thing to sit on that plane for five, six hours. And the babies don't stop crying, and there's no food now, they don't even give you peanuts. It's really hard. And yet, you feel the plane start to tip at the end. And then you hear that, Stewardess, come on, the flight attendant, I'm sorry, come on, and say what? Hey, we've begun our final descent into the Orange County area. Right? Get your, your, your seat backs and your tray tables in their full, upright, and locked position. Prepare for landing. Now, the funny thing about that is the rude guy you're sitting next to who wouldn't say hi to you gets chatty about that point. It's people who've been grumpy and, and leaning back and laying into the eye. Now everybody's sitting up. Everybody's starting to perk up. The chair's got no bigger. The flight's no more enjoyable. The kid behind you has not stopped crying. 
Nothing's really gotten about, better about the flight. As a matter of fact, you feel worse than when you started, and yet there's something internally that goes on when you know we're almost home, see? I know the news, I know the problems in life make us feel, it seems, worse and worse. But remember, as Jesus said, and we're not post-millennial here, right? It's not getting better and better, and then the kingdom comes. The Bible says that the faithful remnant will have to endure many things. But do it as Psalm 112 says. The righteous will never be moved, never be moved. Right? They're not afraid of bad news. Their hearts are steady. They trust in the Lord. They will not be afraid. Nothing more debilitating for the Christian life or for Christian ministry than for you to be afraid, worried, anxious. God says be anxious for nothing. I pray that we wouldn't. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.